제가 그 뉴욕에 있을 때 알았어요. 그래서 제그 석사 학위가 어, 테크놀로지 에듀케이션 포 o 우먼 인 클로징 젠더 갭이었어요. 그래서 테크놀로지에 대한 기술에 대한 교육을 어떻게 하면 잘할수 있는가 여성들한테 왜냐하면 그 미국의 이슈 중에 하나가 지금 미국에서 이슈 중에 하나가 테크놀로지 분야에서 여성의 비율이 굉장히 저조한 게 문제거든요. 우리나라 아마 더 심한 거라고 알려 있고요. 이제 그게 왜 문제가 되냐면 IT 분야가 점점 발전하면 발전할수록 테크놀로지 분야에 대한 자업은 훨씬 더 많이 생기거든요. 근데 그 중에 여성들의 비율이 낮아진다면 컨텐츠 자체 아니면 거기서 서비스되는 그 서비스 자체가 여성 중심적이 아니라 남성 중심적인 서비스들이 많이 나오게 돼요. 그러면서 이제 그것에 대해서 영향을 받는 성이 한쪽으로 기울어지는 그런 현상들이 나타나게 됩니다. 그래서 그것에 관해서 이제 고민을 하던 중에 그때 이제 미국에서 불고 있었던 바람 중에 하나가 이제 메이크 페어라던가 이제 메이크 잡지라던가 크래프트 잡지 이제 이 엘리스 루이스라는 친구는 사실 크래프트 잡지의 그 감수자 역할도 하고 있거든요. 그래서 그게 뭐냐면 테크놀로지 이용해서 합의를 할수 있는 굉장히 유명한 그런 잡지예요. 오라이라는 굉장히 거대 출판사를 출판해서 하고 있는데 거기에 이제 기고도 몇번한 친구고 이 친구가 어, 제 책을 잠깐 보여드릴게요. 그 스위치 크래프트라는 책도 썼어요. 그래서 이 책은 어떻게 된, 된 거냐면 이제 어떻게 보면 처음이었던 것 같아요. 패션 쪽에 테크놀로지를 적용해서 쉽게 누구나 만들 수 있도록 소개한 책입니다. 그래서 사실 우리가 이제 여성들이 가장 많이 하는 일 중에 하나가 어떻게 보면 뭐 소품을 만들거나 우리 뭐 손바느질 막 이런 거 많이 유행하죠. 그런 것 쪽에 약간의 테크놀로지, 전기 전자 지식을 응용할 수 있는 응용하거나 아니면 약간 인터랙티브한 센서 등을 이용을 해서 재밌게 작업을 할수 있는 작업을 소개하고 있습니다. 그래서 미국에서는 패션 테크놀로지라는 그런 분야로 성장을 하고 있고요. 한 가지 예로는 이제 MIT 미디어 그룹의 리아브클리라는 친구가 있어요. 그 친구는 릴리패드라는 거를 이제 개발을 해서 센서, 웨어러블에 쓸수 있는 마이크로 컨트롤러랑 센서들을 이제 제공하는 것들을 좀또 제공을 하고 있습니다. 그래서 어, 어떻게 보면 미국에서는 이제 여성들이 패션을 통해서 테크놀로지, 테크놀로지 쪽으로 접근하는 그런 게 굉장히 트렌드화가 되어 있고요. 그 중에 가장 영향력 있게 그 트렌드를 주도하고 있는 친구 중에 하나입니다. 그래서 굉장히 어려운 자리에, 어려운 기회에 보셨다라고 생각하고 우연히 이제 한국에 오게 돼서 이제 일본으로 이번 주에 떠났는데 아마 여러분들이 좀 듣기 힘들었던 분들은 좋은 강의를 들으실 수 있는 기회가 되고 이 친구 역시 백그라운드가 디자인 쪽이에요. 그래서 디자인 쪽에서 자기 캐리어를 어떤 식으로 패션하고 테크놀로지 쪽으로 접목시켰는가를 보게 되면 굉장히 여러분들 향후에 내가 어떤 식으로 좀 독창적으로 앞서서 나갈 수 있는 것에 대한 어떤 해안을 가질 수 있는 기회가 되지 않을까 싶습니다. 그래서 그런 관점에서 좀 봐주셨으면 좋겠고요. 오늘 아마 이 패션 테크놀로지에 대한 최신 트렌드를 많이 보실 수 있을 거예요. 그래서 이런 것들은 사실 어렵지 않아요. 어렵지 않고 정말 이 책은 아무런 전기전자 지식이 없어도 누구나 따라할 수 있게끔 만들어졌거든요. 그래서 정말 쉽게 접근할 수 있는 방법이니까 많이 해주시고요. 한 가지 더 공지를 드리자면 이번 주 토요일 날 Women Meet Technology라는 주제 여성의 테크놀로지를 만난다라는 주제를 이 친구가 한번더 강연을 할 거예요. 그래서 그때는 이 친구 말고도 여진욱이라고 워치원 의절리티 하시는 포항공대 그 여자 교수님도 한번 오시고요. 그 다음에 그 다음 커뮤니케이션의 검색팀장 그 어, 어. 제가 이름이 갑자기 생각이 안 나는데 그박어박 팀장이라고 어, 계신데 그분이 와서 또그 강연을 해주실 예정입니다. 그래서 토요일 날은 2 시부터 시작되니까 그때도 어, 관심 있으시면 꼭 참여를 해주시고 어, 많은 성원 부탁드립니다. 그러면 아 어, 그러면 큰 박수를 맞춰 주 맞아 주시면 되겠습니다. 안녕하세요. 
most people don't think about um, putting technology with fashion. And my passion in life is to be the bridge between these two chakras. And in fact, there's not a day I don't think about it. Most people think that fashion technology is new. So I want to talk to you and maybe give you a little history. And then show you how that history has inspired me and what I'm working on now and where the future of fashion is going. So let's just take a step back in time a little bit. This is a quick chart that uh, I research fashion's history and also where it's going in the future. And um, the convergence, the combination of fashion technology has been happening since over 2,000 years ago. And at this point in time, it's growing exponentially at a rate we cannot keep up with. So let's just look back for a minute. One of the things about fashion is that it's about aesthetics, magic, identity. It's about ideas and sharing. So for me, one of the first pieces of fashion technology is in uh, Chinese culture, where they used blue glasses to keep out evil spirits. I don't know if this is translated completely well into the Western culture, but um, I like the idea that it's about magic. It's not about uh, making your eyes better. We're going to jump forward to the 1800s. And this is a time when people maybe couldn't hear well, so they created hearing aids. So that's a technology that you're wearing on your body. And they started to think about you know, how to make it look pretty. So this is maybe some of the first things the first ideas where aesthetics and beauty start coming into play. So here we have a hearing aid from, I think it's 1883, and it's got a little flower on the end, so it looks like a headband. Not long after that, um, with the um, creation or the innovation of electricity, there was jewelry being created. Um, this is in France. Uh, this is electronic jewelry, and you can see here, uh, this is a nice brooch that you wear, and it's metal, and on the right hand side is a uh, little uh, chattering teeth as you turn on the uh, electricity, and on the left hand side, the rabbit would play the drums. This is at a time when wearing a battery, uh, the battery was like this big, so you had to hide it underneath your dress somewhere. And it was probably pretty dangerous. Um, I, I can't imagine this being something that I, I really want to wear at the time. But people started playing with these ideas. And you'd also see, uh, after the light bulb was invented, you would see women of wealth wearing this out to costume parties or as a way to show off you know, their success or their husband's success. Um, this is Mrs. Vanderbilt, a very wealthy woman from the United States, um, being the Statue of Liberty. Um, this is like in 1910. Again, uh, the batteries underneath that dress had to probably, uh, I don't know the weight in kilos, but it was probably pretty heavy. About the same time, 1910 to 1930s, over in the Western world. There were uh, a lot of really great science fiction novels happening at the time. So we have Buck Rogers. People are thinking about the future and thinking about space exploration and thinking about how to survive in outer space. And um, in the 1930s uh, World's Fair in New York City, a famous designer named Gilbert Rhodes, who's a product designer. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of him but um, Gilbert Rhodes, not only the product design, but he was asked to create the fashion for the future man. And this is what he created. And this is an antenna on his head, um, a phone on his chest. I don't think he was that far off. I mean, I see all the cell phones, right? 
Um, I don't know what the belt did. I think it helped his posture. And of course, everybody in the future wears, you know, a one-piece suit for some reason. I don't, I don't know why. Uh, I haven't ever figured that out. Why in sci-fi people always wear one-piece suits? But uh, I hope that, I hope that's not true. <laughs> I don't know about that. So here we start to see some of the influence. You know, people are thinking about outer space. Um, their imaginations are being um, pushed upon at this time. They're being stretched. And they're thinking, wow, you know, what does the future look like? You know? At the exact same moment, um, we started having research into aerospace engineering. Um, there was a lot of test pilots. And eventually, we moved into creating the NASA program. And so a lot of advanced materials had to be made. Really pushing the limits, materials that had to uh, not only protect you, but protect you from radiation, materials that had to sustain um, enorm enormous amounts of torque, and um, they had to be breathable. And you had to be able to, you know, breathe in zero gravity. So again, this is on the science side. So you here have the the imagination happening here, right, on the side. And then you have science happening simultaneously. And as usual, these things do not converge or come together very quickly. It takes a little time. Um, but one of the things I really like seeing is in the 1960s, Paco Rabin. Have you guys heard of Paco Rabin? No? Yes. <laughs> oh, there's something I need to say that I didn't say before. So, excuse me. If I, I speak very quickly in English. Anyway, so if I'm speaking too fast, I need you guys to do something for me, okay? Can you, can you copy me right now? If I'm speaking fast, just do this, <laughs> okay? Uh, I do this with um, my English first language students as well. It's nothing to do with being Korean. Um, so Paco Rabin got really excited about all the materials that were being made for space. He looked at nylons and um, he made leathers and he was looking at um, metals and new titanium, and he started using that in his uh, dress designs. Uh, he was a very famous designer, um, Old Couture, so uh, his influence filtered down all the time. Simultaneously, so again, we have art, and then simultaneously, the technology with Edward Thorpe, uh, with the MIT Media Lab, and he created a machine that allowed him to <coughs> count cards. Uh, and in poker, and uh, he kind of got in trouble for it, but he went to Las Vegas and he created a wearable machine that took, um, I think it just kept counting the number of cards that he was keeping. So at this time, he's considering and thinking about how to hide and wear technology, and the designers are thinking about um, how it looks and the aesthetics. They start to come together in the 1960s and 70s. They're still a little different. Um, Diana Du was a designer that went to MIT. She created battery packs that were wearable. And not a lot of people have heard of her, and, and even in the wearable technology world. And uh, it's kind of sad, really. Because she created lighted clothing in the late 60s. 1967, I believe, is this photo, or 1968, one of the two. And she sold this clothing in New York City boutiques. This was years before Steve Mann, who's considered the father of wearable computing, started playing with putting the computer on the body. And Steve Mann's concept is to have a computer that's always accessible and always working. So he's kind of, I mean, to me, his dreams have come true with our new modern cell phone. Right? But again, he's thinking about how to wear it, how to place it, how to carry it on the body. It doesn't look too good, I don't think. I'm really not happy with the aesthetics here. But um, again, these two, these two ideas are starting to merge together. I hope you can see that. I'm going to skip, because of time constraints, up to uh, the 90s. There was a lot of things happening in the 80s in the wearable computing lab at MIT, um, and later in the 90s with someone named Maggie Forth. And um, I'm sure his son can help you with that. 
part of this lady. Um, so you can ask her a little bit about that. But I want to jump um, up to the 90s because it's when Hussein Xiaoyan, uh, who is a high-end fashion designer, decided to start playing with technology in new, new and unique ways, have started to see a real jump in this area. Uh, here we have his robotic dress, and I'm going to show you a video. Has anybody seen this dress? Probably you're going to get a kick out of this. Okay, so in 1997, not that long ago, Hussein um, Xiaoyan created, um, I'm sorry, not 1997. I'm so sorry. Uh, can you hear this? This is PC. Well, anyway, the visuals are there, so. First we had the 
behind designers working with it, and now we're having people uh, that are do-it-yourselfers, DIY, people that make things on their own, they're playing with these technologies as well. So it's happening from both ends of the spectrum. So they're creating things like these shoes, which are 3D printed. Uh, so using new materials, new processes, they have access to these things they've never had before. That's a very powerful thing. Um, here on the right-hand side, this is a uh, jacket called Ping by a girl named Jennifer DeMere. And uh, as you hold and shift the jacket, it's supposed to update your Twitter feed. I don't know what it updates. I think you need to choose that yourself. But, um, and then in the middle, there was a dress recently created that uh, purifies the air. So the clothing that you wear can actually improve the environment that you live in. These are, to me, dynamic concepts that we're working with. So just to reiterate, we started off with some, something like magic. We work into aesthetics. We come into the idea of space. Um, in the 90s, we start thinking about wearable computing, and by the time we get to 2000, it's part of um, an aesthetic dialogue that designers are having, um, futuristic designers. They're moving past stiff wearable tech and starting to think about how to make technology soft and approachable. So thinking about the future, I want to show you something that just came out right now. Has anybody seen the underwear? Mm -hmm. Have you guys seen this? I love this. I came all the way. I came all the way from America to like buy this. I'm not kidding. Uh, it's, it's so amazing. Growing cells and dishes and 
growing clothing from scratch from like stem cells, which is kind of crazy. Uh, there is a lot of funding being put in this area. I live in Silicon Valley in California, and I'm pretty much watching nanotechnology and bioengineering explode. Uh, and I'm very, uh, <clears throat> I would say 99.9% .9 sure that this is going to have a huge impact on the clothing that we wear, the materials that we use, and we'll eventually we'll be doing things like this. I think it's 15 to 20 years. That means we will be actually doing body modification. These are artist renderings, of course. These are just concepts. Um, I know that I'm not the only one that's thinking about this. Um, Phillips um, came up with a really nice concept as well uh, with a movable tattoo. And this is, again, oh, this might be a little racy, so I'm going to forewarn you. I don't know if it's okay. <laughs> So this is thinking about moving even past our clothing and into our skin. This is the future, you guys. I want to hear what you think about it. This is very long, so I'm not going to play the whole thing. allow the wearer to have that control. 
it ended up just being more of a fun play thing. And people kept trying to try it on, and they were like running around and hug each other and make a strange game out of it that just didn't really make any sense, but they had fun. As I was learning about all of this and playing with building my own sensors and working with a lot of things like um, materials that conduct electricity or uh, dealing with uh, wireless sensors or any type of um, electronic technology, I realized something really powerful. Uh, that the skills and craft, the craft, sewing, and fashion skills I had as a young girl were extremely applicable and very worthwhile when working with technology. And I realized that nobody ever took the time to teach me electronics or technology in a way that I found interesting. In fact, most people just want me to make a lamp. There's nothing wrong with a lamp, lamps and chairs. I'm a design student, are beautiful things. But um, going to high school and making a lamp just was like social suicide. I just really didn't want to do that. So I started creating a blog called iCartSwitch.com and um, sharing everything that I had learned through the language of craft. Soon after, not long after, I wrote the book Switchcraft, which I haven't copied yet, have you seen? I don't know what all she said about it, but um, you're welcome to pass them around if you want to take a look. So um, in this book, the main goal was to create 20 projects that are home and fashion accessories that use technology and show people how to work with technology without using any geeky language. That was my goal. And everything had to be beautiful. Everything had to have really nice photography. The model had to be adorable. Actually, she was my intern at the time. And she was adorable and she's all over the book. I had skills as a designer. I was able to, to draw an illustrator if you can. I knew a lot about how to put things together in a way that was aesthetically pleasing. And I focused on those skills to make the book really accessible to an audience that had never seen this sort of um, application before. So here we have, um, this is a boombox beach bag or the Urban Blaster. It has speakers in it. Like snap in and snap out with regular snaps, like the ones you wear in your clothes. And you can make it yourself. Uh, this is a favorite, and in fact, we'll, we'll come back to this. I'll, I'll talk about this more. Um, this is a purse called the T's Bag, um, the shiny clutch. And when you open it, it lights up, but it also has a hidden message. And you can make that message whatever you want. Um, tease, kiss, play. Ha ha ha, lol, you know, whatever it is that you want. Um, and the thing is, is that all of the components to make this can be used in other things. Like, it doesn't have to be in a bag. You could put this in, say, a little sachet. This is something that smells nice and goes to the floor. Pass it around. Um, hold on. Can you, guys see this? can you guys see this up there? It's very, very simple. Um, it's a switch, so when it's off, it just looks like a normal little sachet that smells nice in your drawer. But then when you open your drawer, it lights up. It looks really better in the dark, but um, it also has a little hidden imagery behind it. So again, the idea of magic. This has been all over the world, so it's a little messy, but you're, you're, you're welcome to look at it. Everything in the book is simple. It's not about complicated interactions. It's not about reading my brain waves. It's just about trying to make things fun. I would like to tell you that it was more interesting than that. It's not. It's about thinking about how you can use light to have that feeling of fun or aesthetics or magic. Uh, I got that. Um, the book did pretty well, uh, to be honest. And I got to do something really fun. I don't know if you guys have ever seen Martha Stewart or do you know who she is? Do you know who she is over here? I think that. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Um, yes, my, that's my dog, Mojo, which I understand means, what is that? Which is kind of funny. Mm -hmm. um, so I was asked to go on a TV program um, with a very famous lady who pretty much is the queen of 
home economics, do it yourself. Like, this woman changed America. She's, uh, she's also fairly controversial in some ways, but um, she has her own TV show, her own network, her own. She's like Oprah for craft people, okay? So I got to go on to her show, and she asked me to make doggy costumes. So I did. If she asks you to do something, you do it. That's the role. So I made a porcupine that lights up with fiber optics, and I made a dandelion, uh, you know, like a little flower, and I showed people how to make these. And it was a lot of fun and um, a, a very unique experience, to say the least. Okay. Um, my work has continued. Um, over the past uh, about year and a half, I've just been doing small little things on my website. And I'll tell you why, because I'm working on a, a company on the side. But I've, I've been sharing my designs and my ideas uh, on the website as a way to allow people to have access to things like the Road Darte Light of Heels. Maybe you could be able to make your own. So for $12 or maybe $20 if you want to push it, for $20 you can have your own Light of Heel that looks just as good as the Road Darte or maybe you can adjust it for Jimmy Choo. Uh, as designers, you can you know, use this technology and make it look however you want. I've been going around um, and doing workshops uh, with uh, educational communities. It's been really exciting, and the one thing that I want to point out is that craft and fashion spans all ages. That the skills that these women have, this is an 8-year-old girl, I'm sorry, she's 9, up to a 54-year-old woman in my workshops. And it doesn't really matter. Everybody asks me, when you make a product, what's your age range, what's your age range? My age range is huge. My age range is 18 to 60. What matters is people wanting to try something new or people wanting to expand and um, maybe have a little fun uh, with their fashion and craft. Uh, this is a purse that was made by the nine-year-old girl. It uses conductive thread and LEDs. And when you snap it shut, they turn on. She never touched electronics or done any electronic engineering in her life, nor has she ever sewed. And she did this in one day, or less than a day, probably like three or four hours. The most powerful part about this was that a number of my workshops, people don't leave. They've never done anything like this before. So what happened was, is we did the workshop. We had a fashion show. It was great. Um, one of the projects, which I, I regret that I do not have a video for, one of the projects was um, two dresses that uh, the girls wore, and as they got closer together, the dresses lit up and responded to each other. And it, was, it was really cute, but um, there was too much light in the room, so the video didn't come out. But after the, after the fashion show, they came back the next day, I was still packing, and they were still sitting, and they were still wiring and working with electronics. And I left. So for me, this was a really powerful statement that people are ready and kind of want to understand a little bit more about technology and maybe are ready to see it as more than just uh, a device that you use to capture something or a way to tweet or text. Maybe they're actually ready to start wearing it. Uh, just to give you a sneak preview, this is uh, a project I'm working on right now. It's not finished. I just finished the dress on the left right before I came here, the day. Um, this is a dress that will light up in response to my heartbeat and beat into my heart. And the idea is to make the invisible visible. And I'm going to take it out and go dancing and see how people respond. <laughs> they may love it. They might laugh at me. I don't know. But um, well, I will tell you a trick, though. Is I'm probably not going to be the one that wears this. I'm going to find a really beautiful girl, take good photos, take an excellent video, and let her wear it. Really about you know creating an image and not just about uh, the technology itself. So just to give you an idea, underneath the dress is um, a fabric. This fabric has woven fiber optics inside of it. So uh, you can see the fiber optics coming out here. If you put a light at the end, the whole thing will light up. So the entire dress is going to light up, top to bottom, underneath. I showed a similar technology at TED 
which is uh, how we found out about this a little bit. And I'll let you guys see it. Oh, that's a terrible picture. <laughs> <laughs> Ignore that, please. So this is uh, hooked up to a sensor around my heart and it's blinking in time with my heart while I was presenting. So people really understood how I felt about standing up on stage. I don't know how many people are going to see that, but it was an intense experience and I got to share that with everyone. This leads me to today. I've been working in this. I'm sharing my book. I'm sharing everything I know. I'm giving it out almost for free, pretty much. Um, purely because I'm so empowered by the people that I meet and the things that other people that are creating. But reality is, is that I want to do more. And the reason why I wanted to know if you needed Martha Stewart was because I want to be a Martha Stewart of technology. And I'm not afraid of saying that. The woman who helps everyone not be afraid of working with tech and help make it beautiful and accessible. Okay? So I left New York City, the hub of fashion. I left Parsons School of Design. I left all of that and I moved to Silicon Valley, the heart of tech, which was an insane thing to do on many levels, but it's the right thing to do. Um, I left because I was asked to do something called Singularity University. And I just want to mention it because it's a very unique space and it was very transformative for me. Uh, 80 people from around the world, from 34 different countries, all experts in their field, including, including two from South Korea, Sam Ko, the astronaut that is in space, and uh, my friend um, Tony Liu, who just started something called um, Upstart here, which uh, you guys should make sure you know about that. Okay. It's, a, it's a platform for uh, crowdsourcing money to do your projects. Very, very smart idea. So 80 students from around the world were brought together and I was taught about every aspect of technology. Nanotechnology, bioengineering, computer science, finance, um, even social interaction, internet theory. I can't even think of everything that we studied. Medical. We learned about everything about where it's going to be in the next 10, 15, and 20 years. And we were asked to do something very interesting. We were asked to see what's going to, it's going to happen in the next 10 or 15 years. And we have a job to change the life of 1 billion people's lives in 10 years for the better. So my job is to change 1 billion people's life for the better. And I've only got 10 years to do it. Um, it was an amazing program. Please go look at us online. Please watch their videos. Hopefully it will inspire you. So I decided to do that with something kind of strange. Um, this is the very first prototype. And again, uh, with lights, some of this doesn't really work. This is kind of like going out at night. Anyway, it turns on and off. There you go. Uh, this is the very first very first prototype, it, it doesn't even have like a proper switch. Yeah. We've just been taking out at night, um, sending people out with it at dance clubs. It, it's a wristlet made out of um, it's hand sewn leather. Uh, the, the woman who sewed it is actually um, worked for Air Mass. So everything that I'm trying to do, hopefully, is think about technology in a way where design comes first. Aesthetic comes first quality of fabrics come first. All of these things are really important. Otherwise, it's just another kitsch item or another novelty. Uh, this purse is really fun. It used to have a, a little chain, but I don't like it, so I'm going to do that. And um, people grab it out of my hands and start dancing with it. And they use it like a spotlight on themselves when they're dancing. <laughs> or they use it like a spotlight on their friends, and their friends start doing all this crazy stuff. It's been a really fun interactive experience. And what I've learned from this, uh, and why I started with using just something that's simple as a light, is because 
if you tell, if you make it too complicated, people aren't going to grab this very quickly, right? If I, if I find this, this is a person responding to my Twitter feed, and it's going to, you know, yeah. If that's not going to make it to a mass audience, right? It's, it's uh, through my research um, and studies, is that start simple. Let people decide what it is they want to do with it. So we're just testing it out right now. And I'm here in Korea, and I'm also going to Japan and doing research on um, just trying to get inspired and looking at different types of aesthetics um, and looking at different types of fashion and um, going to create a product line based on this. So how am I going to change the world with a purse? Uh, this is the first step. And eventually having a larger company that is going to have interactive products for home and lifestyle, but also um, support um, teaching girls about technology around the world. So I'm trying to create a company that both has profit and helps the world at the same time. And that's where I stand today. I'm happy to have any feedback or uh, have any questions. And uh, thank you. Sometimes you can face the difficulty between how to make a proper, uh, a proper design as an aesthetic way, but also uh, in technological as way, uh, technological way as well. So have you ever changed or have you ever had to change your uh, first concept design because of uh, uh, technological way? Um, yes, that's a really good question. She's asking uh, basically, you know. When you're having to, you have to modify your initial design based on the technology. That'd be correct. And uh, they go back and forth. And in fact, my process um, is a lot to draw it. And then I make something with the technology and test it. And then I try putting them together. This is the first one put together. And then I know all the things that are wrong with it. And I'm going to go back and shift my design. So it's a, it's a nice kind of marriage. You're going back and forth a lot. It probably takes me about 20 iterations before I get finished. Each project in the book um, was made at least three or four times before the final project was made. Okay, got it. Oh, two minutes. I have a question. Good. Ah, so, um, the bands, the bands, the 어, 이익을 추구하시는 게 아니라 그 아이디어를 뭔가 하시는데 집중하고 계신데 상용화가 되는 제품도 있는지 일단은 어떤 식으로 하고 계시는지 
they're one of my they're one of my sponsors actually. And so understanding the process of design and how it fits into our everyday lives, I follow the design process every single day. And the question about going back and forth between technology and the design, it's pretty much the same thing. Um, in fact, I, I struggle a little more with the technology, <laughs> but that's okay because I know enough that I can pick really good people to work with. And um, does that, that answer your question? Yeah. And that's why I'm in the Silicon Valley as well. I mean, Technologists are amazing. Good question. 